So good morning again, Bill <coughs> Billabong. I think what I'm looking forward to most about Easter is 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 the dawn service. It I actually missed it last year um, when we did it because um, one of our kids um, had a really rough night and didn't wake up. And they usually wake up really early. And so we're like, oh, maybe we just let her sleep. And so Annalise took the other one to dawn service, but I got a bit of a sleep in. Um, Tell you what, one of the hardest things about church planting um, so far is actually probably something you don't expect. Um, The hardest thing I'm finding is remembering that we actually meet in afternoons. I think every single week so far, I've either said, good morning, everyone, or let's go have morning tea now, and it's, it's, it's not, it's afternoon. Um, but yes, uh, both Piara Waters and Canny Vale have been focusing on the theme of becoming um, over the last uh, few weeks, um, and in the lead up to Easter, both Luke and I um, are having a bit of a look at sort of the, the early days of Jesus' ministry and also the final final days before his death and resurrection. Um, And so today I'm going to draw your attention to one of those final moments, which I think is pretty appropriate as we head towards Easter. Um, Now, Luke mentioned before about the Chosen TV series. Who here um, has seen a really good adaptation of the Jesus story in film or TV? Anyone seen some good ones here? I particularly like, um, there, there was a movie called Risen, have people seen Risen? Which is about the soldier who was there at the death of Christ and about his story, which I thought was fantastic. Um, who here has seen a really bad adaptation of a Jesus story in film or th- yeah, TV? There, there's, some, there's some pretty, pretty, pretty bad. And there's some scenes that just don't translate so well to the screen. Um, but for our Bible reading today and the passage that I want to look at, um, I think this is one of the most screen-worthy moments of Jesus' ministry. It is his arrest. So Luke 22, uh, verses 47 to 53, it says, While he was speaking, or while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus' arrest is one of the most dramatic, action-packed stories of his life and his ministry. We've got betrayal. We've got aggression. We've got a kiss. We've got miraculous healing. It's your standard blockbuster movie. And Tell you what, in in researching this, I read the story in all four Gospels, and each of them tells it slightly different. In each one, Jesus says something a bit different, but they've all got that same sort of really, this is a big moment sort of feel. Um, And as I was reading through them, I actually noticed something that I haven't noticed before. Um, Actually, two things, really. Now, the first one that I noticed isn't particularly relevant, um, but I thought it was interesting. Um, At the end of the arrest story in Mark's gospel, um, we're gifted with two verses. Does anyone know what happens in these two verses at the end? No? You probably don't want to say because it's a bit rude. Um, We learn about the naked man. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Who's, who's heard that before? Who's read that before? I'm, I swear I've read it before, but it never really jumped out as, oh, oh, there's a person. We don't hear anything more about them. We don't know who they are. Some people have believed it to be Mark, the writer of the gospel, is as his way of sort of representing the fleeing of the disciples, the running away, the being naked and the symbolism behind that. But isn't it just a bit funny that there was a naked man running around? But that's not what I want this sermon to be about. The... 
more important thing that I feel like I missed was that Jesus performs a miracle. He heals the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, um, who we find out through lots of different readings. His name is Caiaphas. Um, and now, when I said I haven't noticed that before, I have. Like We all know the story, right? If you've read before, if you've been, been around Sunday school, you hear about how we, we think it's probably Peter chopped off the ear of the guy and Jesus heals him. You've, has anyone seen like the claymation version where they put the, like, no? Okay. Um, it's a pretty common story, but it never really struck me as miraculous. Tis merely a flesh wound, the Black Knight would say, and it's no Lazarus rising from the dead or walking on water or loaves and fishes. We don't kind of feel, it doesn't fit into this big miraculous thing, but Jesus does something in that moment that is impossible. But we see it and we think, compared to those aforementioned miracles, it seems a bit ordinary. Now, my topic today is extraordinary, ordinary. Sometimes the extraordinary can seem to be ordinary. So let's delve into it. Why was this healing extraordinary? Well, for the obvious reason of it was a physical healing that, um, that it changed from being an ear that was injured or not even on the head to all fixed, all healed. Um, but if we dig a little deep, we can look into the why of it. So why did Jesus heal Malchus? In fact, why did Jesus heal anyone? If you look through the Gospels, um, you see that Jesus healed a number of times. In fact, it was something that he was well known for. Um, There's some very specific uh, stories like the blind man in Bethsaida um, and other stories of more like general healing like uh, Gennesaret in Matthew 14 where it tells of um, many people were healed just by the touching of his cloak. Um, So... Why this ear of this man? Now, the first reason that I can think of of why Jesus would have healed him was to simply keep the peace. Okay, There was a lot of commotion. There was a lot going on. There was some aggression. And Jesus knew that that outburst of Peter against those soldiers probably would have been enough to arrest Peter, maybe even kill Peter for that attack. And so... There's that reason of, okay, let's, let's do this because otherwise, bam, there goes a good chunk of the New Testament. So made sure that the peace was kept. Um, Jesus was also at peace with himself. Um, Luke preached, I think last week, um, about his praying just before this in the Garden of Gethsemane where he um, says, not my will but yours. Um, Jesus knew the path that was laid out for him and he was at peace with it. But again, I don't think this tells the whole story. The second reason why Jesus might have chosen to do this healing was um, to repair what was broken. Now, when he rep- by healing that reparation, it might be a problem of there's not enough wine at the wedding, Jesus' first miracle. There might be a young girl who passes away too soon and that needs repairing. Or maybe the grandest scale possible, repairing the curse of sin. We know that Jesus healed because he had compassion, he had faith. But he knew well that just the healing of those mater- our material bodies, that's not the end, that's not the end goal, that's not the purpose. And if we just view Jesus as the man who came, lived among us, healed some people and left, it misses the point and it, it severely diminishes the mission um, that he had and had in this world, had and has in this world, sorry. So he brings peace to the situation, he repairs what is broken, but he doesn't leave it there. Every miracle leads to the opportunity to save. You see, it's not a coincidence um, that we're told exactly what happens in this scene and to who. Details are important. Details are there for a reason, um, because it points to something worth looking at. We're told that the person injured, his name is Malchus. We're not told his name in this gospel, but in some of the other ones you you can glean that and that he's a servant to the high priest Caiaphas. Malchus is the one who was sent along with the soldiers and Judas to confirm that Jesus had been arrested. Malchus would direct 
uh, report directly to the priest, and he would be the eyes and ears on the ground. Malchus is there as a representative of something higher, and he is there to listen. Additionally, we're told that it's his right ear that's cut off. Um, and just back then, as it is now, we often associate the, the right side with power, okay? Right hand man, um, that sort of thing. So when Jesus restores this ear to Malchus, he's restoring the essence of his very role as the ears to the high priest. He is restoring the power that he had. And what do you think the report back to the high priest would have been? Oh, yeah, yep, look, we got him. Everything worked out fine. There's a bit of aggression. In fact, one of my ear actually got chopped off, but the guy we arrested, he, he healed it. Can you imagine the thoughts going through the head of Malchus in this moment, in the hours and days after this? This guy who we're sentencing to death, he, he healed me. The person there to make sure he got arrested. Now, I don't necessarily think that the story of Malchus and his healing would have changed the mind of the high priest. In fact, I'm pretty sure it didn't based on the events that follow. But it might have changed the mind of Malchus. In one of his final moments prior to his death and resurrection, in fact, the final recorded miracle of Jesus before his death, he healed someone. And more likely than not, he brought him into discipleship. He brought him closer to God. Now, as I said earlier, I sometimes get lost in the big. Okay, We, we kind of focus on the, the big things and the most extraordinary things, um, the crazy, the impressive, um, that we sometimes, or I sometimes, miss the extraordinary that seems ordinary. To those who know what Jesus can and did do in the power of the Spirit, fixing an ear <laughs> seems trivial. But to Malchus, that might have been the sign that brought him to faith in Jesus and maybe even others because of him. And I think all of this points to the big picture. The reason for all of it, which is God's kingdom. Jesus' first words in the Gospel of Mark say, um, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. And that is exactly what this is about. King, God's kingdom is what Jesus was there to bring, what they're there to show and to give us a glimpse into what it was. God's kingdom has perfect peace. God's kingdom has perfect restoration and renewal of all things. And when Jesus healed, when Jesus performed his miracles, he gave us a glimpse of that kingdom and showed us how awesome it is. And that brings us to the here and now. As we go about our business as a church, in what ways are we being extraordinary? In what ways are we showing this kingdom here in Canningvale, in Piara Waters, in Armadale, in Byford, in Ranford, I don't know, anywhere? Um, have a think about it because I think sometimes we hold ourselves back by not believing that what we're doing is really extraordinary. I might not be able to heal someone with a touch, but I can have a conversation with a student at lunchtime at the school where I'm helping out, and that might be life-changing. Um, we can offer to share a meal with a family in need. That's not that crazy when it comes, when, when you're in a church background, right? People in here have shared meals before, but for someone who's never received a free meal from someone, that can be incredible. Jesus showed us through his miracles what it's like to do great things to bring peace and repair and save. And I want, you to, I want to challenge everyone here today to think about the ways that we might do as he did. Now, I gave this sermon last week in a slightly different form um, to the church plant, Piara Waters church plant, um, and I ended by giving them all a bit of a challenge. Um, have we got the picture? 
Yep. Um, so afterwards, we all put on gloves, we grabbed garbage bags, and we walked around Harrisdale Senior High School picking up rubbish. Now, is picking up rubbish extraordinary? No, of course not. But is voluntarily picking up rubbish on a Sunday afternoon with a group as big and mixed as this one at a school that none of us go to or the kids go to in a suburb that none of us live in. It's at least a little weird, but our thoughts behind that was we want to be a church for the community. We want to share the love. And sharing the love is sometimes picking up rubbish. We also want to be out there and open, we want to be able to talk to people. And there were a lot of people there, not picking up rubbish with us. They were playing games. There was a wedding going on in one of the um, community facilities there. There were some people playing sports in the Oval. There were lots of people out there. And yeah, a few of them came and asked, what are you guys doing? And we got to share. We're a church. We're picking up rubbish. So that's what Harrisdale PR Waters do, did. Now, I am not going to ask Bill upon Cannyvale to do that today because you've got an AGM to get to after this. But... I want you to think about the ordinary moments and why they're extraordinary. We just shared in communion. Now, there's nothing magical about communion. I'm sorry to break anyone's like hearts and minds. It, it's, it's bread and it's grape juice. It's pretty ordinary if you just think of it of eating some bread and drinking some drink. But it's also extraordinary. It's immensely extraordinary because it is our chance to remember about that night. It's a chance for us to connect and commune with God. And I think that's extraordinary. How about um, when we pray? When we pray, it can sometimes just feel like a duty or just kind of going through our shopping list with God. But we're communing with God. We're talking to God. It is extraordinary, even in the ordinary. And then finally, another one is like baptism. If you haven't been baptized, you should get baptized. Because it's a chance to share in that connection with your church and with God. And again, it's not magical. You do not, there's no, there's no kind of spells or that sort of stuff going on. No, it's not. But it is extraordinary. It's incredible. Those are just a couple of things that you could do or are doing that are extraordinary and are a chance to show people around what the kingdom of God is like. What else could you do or what else are you doing? Is there anything? Maybe as a small group. Maybe in, in your workplaces. Maybe right after church on a Sunday. Maybe right before church on a Sunday. Really encourage everyone here to think about the things that we do in our lives and what it looks like to others. To get, give every opportunity an amazing, look, to find every opportunity and give it a chance. And to go out there and see if we can share this kingdom. Because if you believe in it, if you know it's true, it is the best thing to share. Dear Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you for those glimpses of the kingdom that we got through the miracles that Jesus shared. And, and God, I pray that you draw our attention to those ordinary moments, the times when we might think, maybe I'm not doing too much. Maybe it's not that important. And God, show us how you can work through those moments. I pray that you help us to heal the relationships that need healing, repair the things that are broken in our lives and in the lives of others, and God, to encourage us to bring people closer to you so that you might save them. In Jesus' name.